Welcome everybody to ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Qt, Building Apps. My name is Lucas Danzier and I'm joined by my colleague Koshik Hajra. We're both engineers on the Runtime SDK for Qt team and we're here today to deliver a beginner session to expose you to the Runtime SDK for Qt and show you a little bit about what it can do and how you can get started. We'll start by having a high level, high level overview of the Qt framework and then we'll get into the runtime SDK for Qt, some of its capabilities and how you can get started. After that, we'll jump into some of the fundamental development patterns that you'll see in the API. Next, we will go over how Ezra uses Qt and we'll finally finish up with where you can go from here. So first, what is Qt? The Qt framework is a set of portable write once, run anywhere libraries that build as, as native C++. They're very approachable libraries because they're high level abstractions. So instead of having to deal with the individual platform implementations of all of the different things that you'll need to do as developers, like make, make HTTP requests or file IO, Qt exposes you one nice high level abstracted API that you can work against. These APIs are developed in the open, and you can get it as open source or commercial uh, supported software. So the Qt framework, um, as I mentioned, it's cross-platform libraries for native app development. And the key thing there is native app. This, these aren't web apps that are running within a browser. Generally, your business logic is going to be written in C++ and your UI uh, will be in a language called QML, which is JavaScript based. Their mantra is write once, deploy everywhere. And you can deploy to all of these different operating systems, Linux, Windows, Mac, iOS, Android. The nice thing is that all of the platform nuances are abstracted from you. And as I mentioned, the abstraction APIs um, are available for common native workflows. So local data storage, this is something you want if you're making offline uh, native apps. You want to be able to do file I.O. You want to interact with the sensors, like the accelerometer. Um, you want to do Bluetooth, NFC, GPS, and so on. So how does it all work? Well, at the top you have your application. Your application will call into Qt's GUI libraries, so things like combo boxes and buttons and charts. These are how the user will interact uh, with your application. User interaction will then call into the Qt abstracted APIs like Qt Network Manager and Qt File. And underneath all of that, uh, this is the complexity if you wanted to build apps for every single one of these platforms. You can see there's different languages for every platform. Uh, Java on Android and Objective-C for iOS. C++ for Linux. We've got different native platform APIs. We have different compilers. Uh, there's lots that goes into supporting all these different platforms. But with Qt, you just need to work with the one API, which is very nice. So which platforms can you build for? Um, this is specifically with the runtime SDK for Qt. We support Windows, x86, and x64. Linux, we support 64-bit. We also have an embedded ARM64 beta. We support Mac OS. Android, we support ARM v7 and ARM v8, which is a 64-bit version, as well as x86 for simulator. In iOS, we support ARM64 in the simulator. So what are some of the capabilities uh, of the ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Qt. We support offline maps and scenes, offline routing and geocoding, offline geometry analysis with our geometry engine. We have full-blown symbol APIs and renderers with customizations from Pro. We support geoprocessing, searching, identify, query, pop-ups, uh, we have a ArcGIS platform access and identity, so you can sign in to your organization and access your organization's content. We support the utility network. We support navigation 
to get turn-by-turn -turn directions. We now support augmented reality, which is really cool. We this means we have one, um, again, abstracted API that you code against, and you can get augmented reality experiences for both Android and iOS. And last but not least, we support data collection and editing workflows. So now we're going to jump over to a demo from Koshik where he's going to walk us through our sample viewer, which is shipped with our SDK. And he'll show us some of the capabilities that we have within the runtime. Thank you, Lucas, and a warm welcome to everyone. As Lucas mentioned, we will have um, we will have um, we are going to show you a few things with what the SDK can do today. So <clears throat> to begin with, I'm going to show you a samples viewer app that we ship with our application with our SDK. We ship a, min, a few different components with our SDKs, and Samples Viewer is one of them. So what is the Samples Viewer? It's a binary that we ship, and it's a binary that runs all our samples that we have. Now, where are our samples? They're all in GitHub, and they're all open sourced. So you can choose to download them, um, fork the rep entire repo, clone them, make changes. You can even submit a PR to us. Um, if, if you feel something, you could improve upon, on something. So, <clears throat> and this, this viewer has all of those samples and mm, you can view them in live mode. So let me give you a quick tour of the samples app. So on the left hand side, what you have is all these different um, categories that shows um, the categories that we, um, we organize the samples in. So there is a maps category which has a bunch of samples and then there is a scenes category which has all the 3D samples. Um, I'm going to delve deep into the samples later on. <clears throat> but before I get into that, let's show you the other parts of the samples viewer app. If you scroll over to the right hand side menu, what you see is the live sample which is here. You know, you can zoom in, zoom out and you can do a lot more with the other samples. Then you see something that uh, shows the source code. So for every sample, you can actually see the source code. So in this case, you have the source code for the QML file, for the header file, the CPP file. If you want to copy any piece of code that you might find useful, you can just go ahead, highlight it, right click and copy. Even though the text doesn't show up here, it says copy. So you can copy it and paste it. Um, then if you head over to the description, it shows you exactly what the sample does. This is what the sample does, how it works, and all the features that of the API that the sample is targeting. So in this case, for example, it's targeting map view API, the map API, the base map API. So those are different classes in the API, and you can take a look at them in, in the API reference, which brings me to the next section its API reference. So when you click on the API reference, it takes you straight to the developer um, API reference on the website, which is really cool because there are a lot of um, times when you need to look at the API reference. So here's the C++ API reference. In Qt, for example, we have two different APIs. One's the C++ API and one's the QML API. Uh, the C++ API is obviously the um, more common API that a lot of people use. Um, and here you can filter the classes that we have um, and look for um, any class that you might want and explore more. So if we go back, the last two are just settings and the about has the sample, the bill number and things like that. So having said that, that's all about the samples viewer app. Now let's take a quick look and see some of the um, individual samples and see how the samples um, work and um, what you can do with this. So let me quickly switch over to the live sample. And then here's a search, so I can quickly search for any sample. So these are some of my uh, favorite samples, and I can quickly show you what they do. So the first one is the distance measurement. So this is a 3D sample where you can measure distance of one object to another. 
So when, when I look at it like this, and if I click on any point, you can get a distance here for, um, and you can switch the unit as well. So it shows the distance from this point to that point. Another sample that I really like is routing. So there is a find a route sample. And what does this sample do? There is a point A, point B, and it solves a route between two different points. Once I click that, it shows the route. Once I click this button, it shows, shows me the individual routes between them. OK. Here's a third one. Um, geocoding is another of my favorite samples. So if I go to offline geocode, so right now if I actually switched off my Wi-Fi and went in offline, this sample would still work because I this is an offline geocoder. So I actually have downloaded the data for it. So if I switch to any other point, what it does, it takes the address, does the geocoding, finds that point and drops that point on the map. And for each sample, as I mentioned, you can go here, look at the source code. Uh, another one that I would like to show you is KML. Um, here's the display of KML. This requires some data. I'm not going to download it right now. I can just show display KML links. This one's really cool because, as you can see, it, this KML file has live links in it, and um, they refresh as, we, as the data updates. So this is a really cool sample. Another one is renderers. So if I type renderers, so there are different kinds of renderers that we have. So I can select something which is feature layer rendering mode. Here's a rendering mode as called, in, in this case, the rendering mode is static, and in this case, rendering mode is dynamic. And you can see like how smoothly this one zooms in, and here the zoom takes a little bit. Once I've zoomed in, the, the draw refreshes. But here the draw is completely smooth. So it just shows the difference in static and dynamic rendering. You can actually start an animation, and it'll, it'll show you even a better representation of it. So th these were some of the, um, just a tour of the samples app, and it shows uh, the power of the ArcGIS runtime for Qt SDK and shows all the cap some of the many capabilities that we ship. With that, I'll hand it back to Lucas. Okay, so now that you've seen a little bit about what the API can do, we're going to talk about how you can get started using it. The first thing you want to do is set up your Qt account. So you'll go to qt.io, which is the Qt Frameworks website. You'll create an account, and then you'll need to determine if you need a commercial license or open source. And Qt has documentation on when you need to have a commercial license and when open source is suitable. Next, you'll need to install the kits for all the different target platforms you need to support. For Qt, a kit refers to the compiler, debugger, and other tools needed in order to build and deploy to those platforms. So for example, if you wanted to build a mobile app, you would need to install the iOS and Android kits. Once you've installed Qt, you'll next want to install the runtime SDK for Qt. You'll need to do this through the developer site, which is developers.arcgis.com. On this site, you can create a free developer account and install the SDK directly from the links in the guide. You also need to install the compiler and SDK dependencies. If you think a few slides back, you might remember that there's many different compilers that power all the different platforms. So even though you won't be interacting directly with Xcode and Visual Studio, you will need to install the compilers from those frameworks. So if you want to develop for macOS and iOS, you'll need to install Xcode onto a Mac. If you want to develop for Windows, you'll need to install the Visual Studio C++ compiler for Linux, you'll need GCC. And for Android, you can build Android apps on Mac, Windows, or Linux. But you'll need to install the Android NDK, as well as the Android SDK. The IDE of, of preference is Qt Creator, although you can use others if you like. 
Qt Creator is what comes with the Qt framework and is best suited for development with Qt. There's three main different app development patterns when you're developing a Qt application. The first we refer to as QML with Qt Quick. In this case, QML is the programming language and Qt Quick is the UI framework. Qt Quick is the more modern framework from Qt that allows for support for touch screens, smooth animations and transitions. And when you're using QML, you're really uh, you're writing code that looks a lot like JavaScript. We'll talk about this in the next slide, but this is a great place for web developers to start. If you're not familiar with Qt um, and you're not a C++ developer, this is the pattern we'd recommend you using. And this supports all of the different platforms. This is the frame, this is the pattern that App Studio uses. The second option is C++ with Qt Quick. In this case, you'll be using our C++ API. So this is great for C++ developers, uh, but the nice thing is that you can use QML for your UI only, and this gives you a nice separation of logic between your QML UI and your C++ backend. This option also supports all of the different uh, platforms. Finally, we have C++ with Qt widgets, and this again uses C++ as the API. Uh, this is great for C++ developers, and this is really a desktop only um, workflow. This has been around for quite a long time, so it's a very robust toolkit, but some of, the, some of the tools that are available might not scale as well for uh, mobile platforms and touch screens, so it's really just targeted for desktops. So the QML API, I mentioned that it looks a little bit like JavaScript code. Um, this is the declarative language that comes from the Qt company. You declare components, it's similar to writing JSS, uh, JSON or CSS, uh, but then you can actually write procedural code as JavaScript functions. This allows you to create your UI rapidly with the Qt Quick uh, framework. We've extended the QML API to give runtime types uh, to the QML language. So you can see in the code below, we've got map views, map, base map, feature layers, all these things that you'd come to expect exposed in a nice uh, QML API. As for our C++ API, this is a bit more flexible because there are a few different uh, target frameworks. There's also more options for integration with C++. Um, as I mentioned, the most common design pattern is to use U your UI is going to be uh, using QML and your uh, backend business logic will be in C++. One of the advantages with C++ is that we also have access to our local server. Uh, local server is something that allows you to run geoprocessing packages that are published in ArcGIS Pro. And this really gives you uh, some pretty fine-tuned analysis tools right locally on your desktop system. If you need help choosing between C++ and QML, we have a topic for this in our developer site guide. So now Koshik's going to walk us through how to build your first app using the IDE templates that are shipped with the SDK. So as Lucas mentioned, in this case, we're going to show you um, how to get started. So once you've done the installation, and once you've gone through that process of downloading the SDK, the installing, and then running a small tool called Post Installer, what you get is, and you open Qt Creator. If you click on File and New File or Project, what you'll see is there are three different templates here. This one is for the C++ API. This one is for the C++ API with the QML front end, which is what I'm going to show you in a little bit. Um, and that's a very common workflow because um, this, this template is supported on all platforms. Just a point to note is widgets is just supported on the desktop platforms. And this one is um, purely QML where you write your um, objects as declarative objects and your code is in JavaScript basically. So I'm going to take you um, a quick look at the C++ um, template where your UI is QML. So once I select that, I go through the defaults and 
once it creates a project for me, once I switch to the build type, if I build and run, what do I get? I get a map right out of the box, which is fully functional map. Now I can start building upon it. This is your go-to point. You get started with just a map, and then from that point onwards, you can add whatever components you want. So in this case, let me quickly show you how to add a QML component. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a button, which is in QML. I'm going to give it an ID called BDN. I'm going to give it a text. I'm going to call it click me. And then I'm going to add a handler for its on click event. And in the on click, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the function that I will, I'm going to declare in C++. So I'm going to call the function show message. So now I've declared a function, but that function doesn't exist yet. So if I open up the source file and go to the header, I'm going to add a function here. And the way you declare functions in C++ when you have to use them from QML is through Q invocables. So I'm going to call it Q invocable void and I'm going to call it show message. Now I have to implement it in um, C++. So I'm going to copy this signature and then switch over to my C++ file and I'm going to add the function. Oops, remove the void. And in this case, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a QDebug, which should print a message in the console. And then I'm going to say button was clicked. Now, if I build and run again, save all, you see a button on top of my map view. When I click this button, you should see that there was this message that was clicked. So you saw how easy it was to create a component in QML. In this case, my UI is QML. And because it is QML, it's supported on all platforms. So no matter what platform I run in, this would work. Of course, if you want to customize it for your own platform, for a certain target platform, you could all, always do that. But I'm just showing a very simple case here. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Lucas. Um, who's going to talk you through with um, the different programming paradigms in Qt and how we support it in the runtime SDK. Back to you, Lucas. OK, so next we're going to jump into some runtime fundamental patterns that you're going to notice within the Qt API. The first thing we're going to talk about is the asynchronous uh, component of the API. Runtime is a modern asynchronous API. Uh, and you'll see this throughout our throughout the uh, list of classes. A lot of them will be tasks. So, for example, route task, locator task, offline map task, geoprocessing task, and then even methods within classes like map dot save. All of these are asynchronous, and all of them follow the same pattern. All of them are also loadable. So, loadable is an interface that all of these types implement, and loadable ensures. Uh, that all of the resources needed for that object are initialized asynchronously. All of these different tasks and classes have asynchronous functions to execute their tasks, and then we have task watcher objects that are returned to keep track for concurrent use. Now in Qt speak, we have signals and slots. Signals are synonymous with events, and slots are synonymous with event handlers. You can define slots as either standalone methods or inline lambda functions. 
So let's look at an example, in this case, locator task. Locator task has a function called geocode. Geocode takes in a string and returns a task watcher. So that's our first indication that this is asynchronous. Next, in the signal section of the API reference, you'll see geocode completed. This signal emits whenever the geocode completes. You can see it has a task ID that's passed through, so you can keep track of your concurrent uses. And in this case, geocode results are passed through. Let's take a look at the code to see how you would wire this up. So first we're going to create a new locator task by passing in the path to a local locator file. Uh, down here we're going to execute a geocode and that will kick off the asynchronous task. Once that completes, geocode completed will emit. In this case we're using an inline lambda function with Qt's connect function. So the syntax for this is to call connect, pass in the locator task, then reference the signal, then we have our capture list. In this case, we're just going to pass everything through for simplicity. Uh, then we have our parameters that are passed through by the signal. And then inside of the signal uh, handler is what we're going to actually execute. So in this case, we're going to loop through the geocode results, and perhaps we want to create graphics for each result. How would this look if you're using QML? Well, it looks a little different because QML, again, is a declarative language, so we have a locator task and a URL. Uh, but in this case, we connect up by putting the keyword on in front of the signal. So the signal is geocode status changed, and in this case, we'll say on geocode status changed, and then this function block will execute um, once that geocode status changes. So with that, I'll hand it over to Koshik, who is going to show us some more asynchronous coding with Qt. So as Lucas talked about, right now we're going to show you how asynchronous models work in uh, the Qt SDK. <clears throat> so here, what I've done, let me first quickly run through this demo. This is a demo that I've created. Um, from a template app that temp I built on a template app that I showed you in the last demo, and I've started to build up on it. So let me quickly show you um, how this works, and then I'll run, go over the code with you. So when I run this, what you see is a scene. I can I have a button to zoom to a certain viewpoint, and once I get to the viewpoint, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on some a certain location and you just saw that when I clicked on that location it added a point and every time I click on a location it added adds a graphic so what is happening here when I when I'm clicking on the screen the mouse knows the screen coordinate now we have to have a way of translating that screen coordinate into a real-life geographic coordinate so that's what I'm going to show you in code how you're doing that we and this is being done is in an asynchronous way. So let's take a look in the code. So I've hooked up the map, the mouse clicked signal. So every time I click on the mouse, uh, I mean click on the scene, this signal gets evoked. And this is just a simple lambda that I have. And if you have a complex function, you could um, create your own function and um, call that from your lambda. But this, this is a very simple lambda. Um, all I'm doing there is I'm calling an asynchronous function which is called screen to location. So basically it takes the screen coordinate and runs some, anal runs some calculations and gi gives back a map coordinate. So what does screen to location take? It takes in a mouse x and the bounce y, which is basically the screen coordinate. So remember what I said, screen to location is an asynchronous function. So once I've clicked on it, once I've called the function, I need to wait for it to complete it. So because it's an asynchronous function, I have connected to um, the signal that gets emitted once it's done, which is screen to location completed in this case. So once the screen to location is completed, that's when I get back 
a real life geographic location from this point object. So what do I do? I have created the graphic already outside of these lambdas, um, which, which is the graphic you saw. And every time you click on um, a different location, I set the geometry of the graphic to the point that I get back from that screen to location completed. So you can see how lambdas work in our APIs. And it's very simple. This is a very, again, I, just to reiterate, this is a very simple function. But if you had any, and there are times when you might need a very complex function. And there are a lot of uh, tasks in our API which take, uh, where you have to do a lot of work. So you can choose to do them outside of the function or in inline lambdas. In this case, I just because it's so simple, I've just just for the sake of demonstrations, I've done it in inline lambda. Um, please feel free to use um, these these techniques in your application when you um, when you are building an application. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Lucas again, where he's going to talk about um, memory management. Next, we're going to talk about memory management in the Qt SDK. And the first important thing to know is that C++ is not a managed language. By this, we mean that memory will not be automatically handled for you. In comparison to other languages like C Sharp or Java, which will have a garbage collector running periodically, you'll need to manage the memory on your own. And some of the pros of this are that it's very close to the metal, as we like to say. This means that you can fine-tune performance to be very fast, uh, but you can also fine-tune your performance to run on memory-constrained devices, like embedded devices. Some of the cons are that this is going to be a little bit of extra work for you to manage. However, there are some new language features in C++ that make this pretty convenient. The first way you manage memory in a Qt application is by using Qt's parent-child relationship. Whenever you create a new object, you need to pass in a parent object. When the parent object is deleted, so are the children. The parent object can be any Q object or anything derived from Q object. So oftentimes you'll see the keyword this. Any object you create on the heap, it's up to you to manage. However, any object we return to you from the runtime API always has a parent set. In some cases, you might want to reset this or manage it on your own. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. Let's take a look at this code sample here of an application called Hello World. You can see that Hello World takes in a Q object parent and it also subclasses Q object. Inside of the constructor, we're creating a new graphic and we're passing in a parent object, this. In this case, this refers to the instance of Hello World. So when Hello World is deleted, so will graphic. Now that's great, but sometimes you're going to want to clean up your memory throughout the lifetime of your application. For example, if you have app, an app with lots of temporary graphics being added or removed, you don't want those temporary graphics uh, memory allocated for the lifetime of the application. You want them freed up um, as soon as you're done using them. Another case where you might need to clean up memory throughout the application lifecycle is when we pass signals through as pointers. Again, there is a parent object set by our API, um, so you don't have to worry about leaking. However, the memory will continue to grow each time it emits, and you may not want that. The solution is to use a technique called RAII, which stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. In C++11, which is a newer language uh, implementation, we now have a concept of smart pointers. These include shared pointer, unique pointer, uh, weak pointer. There's other meth methods as well of RAII. But let's take a look at uh, a shared pointer in practice. So in this case, we're connecting up to the map quick view identify graphics overlay completed signal. So in this example, we would click on the map. We'd want to identify which graphic we clicked on. Every time you do that, the signal will pass through an identify graphics overlay result pointer. Again, this pointer does have a parent, so this isn't technically leaking. However, um, 
this will continue to grow every single time you click on the map and perform and identify. Because of this, we'll use a unique pointer. We'll wrap the result in a unique pointer, and when this lambda block returns, the identify graphics overlay result will be deleted as well. So that was C++ memory management. Let's take a look at how you manage memory in QML. Of course, I'm joking in this case because QML is a managed language. There's a garbage collector for you, so you don't need to think about memory at all. At all. One thing to be aware of is if you are working with JavaScript functions inside of your QML application, you are subject to JavaScript JavaScript function block scope. So if you create a new object within a function and it does not have global scope, if you then kick off an asynchronous task on that object within that function and the function returns, you won't get any results back depending on when the garbage collector runs. So this is important to know because you may run into some timing issues. So next we'll hand it over to Koshik who's going to walk us through a demo of C++ memory management. Koshik? In this demo, we are going to uh, talk a few things about memory management. So as Lucas mentioned, there are different ways you can manage memory in, in, um, in, in runtime SDKs for Qt. So in this case, what I'm going to show you is um, you know, how I'm managing memory of, of couple of objects. So if you remember, when I ran the app, I had to create a graphic. Where are graphics drawn on? They're drawn on the graphics overlay. I Did I need those graphics and the graphics overlay for the lifetime of the application? Yes, I do. And that's the reason what I've done is I have created a graphics overlay, which is a shared pointer. What would have happened if I created a unique pointer of, out, uh, for a graphics overlay? Well, once this function exited that would have gone out of scope and um, I wouldn't the graphic would have never drawn and I would have gotten a crash when I tried to use the graphics solar somewhere else so obviously that doesn't work so what I did is I created a shared pointer and then um, I can reuse it elsewhere in my code so here is where I'm creating the graphics overlay setting some properties and then I'm creating a picture marker symbol so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm creating a raw pointer. You might ask, why didn't I create a unique pointer again? It's for the same reason, because once this function goes out of scope, my symbol goes away. And if the symbol goes away, the graphic doesn't have access to that symbol, so the application starts crashing. Um, now, why didn't I use a shared pointer either? I could have, but I chose not to for the sake of demo, saying, showing how to use a different pattern so both patterns work so we wanted to show you um, how to use a raw pointer and using this as the parent in this case so this means the application is the parent in this case so it, this this symbol would live on um, for the life cycle of this application and if you want to see um, as soon as I start hovering over these um, objects you can see that it's prompting me if I want to look at you know, the help or something, then I can just create F1, and I can see the, um, you can see that the help is integrated within the queue creator. That's another really nice component that we ship. So please make use of it as you're coding if you need to. A lot of times, you know, there are five or six constructors on the object available. So it's really handy just to see uh, what, what are the things that are available on that object. So just a quick tip there. Let me close this so I have some more bandwidth or some more screen width. Um, and then, same way I'm creating a renderer and the renderer makes use of that um, symbol that I just created. And then I'm creating a renderer scene properties and setting those properties. I'm setting a heading and I'm setting some you know, rotation type on the, uh, on the renderer. And then, I set the simple render on the graphics overlay. And then what I do is I append the graphic on the graphics overlay. This is when I append the graphic. 
um, right above. Um, so I, I created a graphic which is of type shared pointer as well, which is the exact same reason why I used the shared pointer. So if I run this application again, probably have it running right here, and the whole purpose of this demo is just to animate the graphic. And as um, as you can see, like the graphic is constantly um, changing locations. I'm, what I'm having to do is as it goes through the cycle, I'm changing the geometry um, of, of the graphic. So um, as you can see here, um, when, when I'm animating the graphic here, I'm calculating the heading, I'm constantly setting the geometry. Um, once I get the new, every time I go and create a new geometry for the next location, and um, I'm setting the geometry to the new point. So you can see like how throughout the application, I needed to keep the graphic alive, the graphics overlay alive, and um, and the other objects like the symbol and the render alive. So I needed to have those um, objects stay alive for the for the entire application cycle. So there are cases when um, you would need a unique pointer. For example, if you're creating an object within a loop time and again, make use of unique pointers in those cases because you want you don't want um, the parent to be the application because it keeps building up. They will, of course, not leave because they will, um, they will go away once the application goes away, but it keeps on building up. So if you use unique pointer, as soon as it exits the loop, uh, every time it cycles through the loop, it will get cleaned up. So your application will stay uh, lean. Um, so that's a quick uh, tour of um, how we handle memory. With that, I'm going to pass it back to Lucas again. Um, he's going to talk about list models how we do list models in our API. Back to you, Lucas. OK, for the final section of the runtime fundamentals, we're going to discuss list models. List models are how Qt does MVC or MVVM. And these are concepts used to separate your business logic from your view. We expose list models for any type of list or array that is mutable. So for example, the layer list model or the graphic list model, these are things that are mutable um, in our API. So we expose them as list models. The nice thing about list models is that they can easily be displayed with several of the cute types out of the box. These include list views, table views, and grid views. And these types of views are what are going to power things like your pop-up to show key value pairs for your attributes, tables like your attribute table. These types of things make it really nice to plug and play. Just take the model and display it in the view. Now there's three key concepts when you're working with list models and list views. There's the model, which is the type that we expose. That's the data. So in the case of layer list model, it's all of the different layers. Then there's the view, and that's what is displayed on the screen. Then there's the delegate. And the delegate's the individual component, and this is what will access the model's different roles. On the right side of the screen here, you'll see a layer list, uh, and this includes some group layers. So you'll see we've got buildings group at the top. This is a group layer. And then we've got two sublayers underneath that, dev A and dev B building shells, and then several additional layers. The list view is the entire component that you're looking at. But each, each individual component with the checkbox and the text next to it, that's the delegate that's getting displayed. So let's take a look at how you'd identify these things in the documentation. If you're looking at the map API reference, you'll see there's a getter called operational layers, and this will return a layer list model. If we click on the layer list model link, you'll see that this type inherits from Q abstract list model. If you follow the Qt documentation, you'll see that this is the list model that powers all of Qt's uh, lists and list models and views. Finally, you'll see all the different roles that are exposed by this list model. So in this case, we could have the delegate access the name, description, visibility, and so on. So let's look at this in code. 
Here we're looking at some QML code where we're declaring a list view component. Next on line five, we are setting the model to the map.operational layers property. We're just directly binding to it here, and this will populate the view with the data. And then finally, we're declaring the delegate. And again, think of these as the individual components that we're going to display. So in this example, it's simply a label, and we're going to access the name role. But we could, we could access any of those roles here. We could use the description, um, we could use visibility, and so on. So now Koshik's going to walk us through an example of how you can use list models in our Qt SDK. So in this case, in this demo, I'm going to quickly uh, give you a tour of how list models work in our API. So as Lucas mentioned, there are a lot of cases um, in our API when you need a list model. And list models are great to show um, when list of objects and when you have to edit them back and forth. It, 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 it does a really good job of um, at handling those. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, let me quickly run this application. So this is the same routing sample that I had shown you before. And guess what? This is the exact project that I downloaded from GitHub. And I'm just reusing that exact project. So here's point A, point B, show route. And here's my direction. So where is the list model in this sample? This directions is shown via a list model. So how did we create that? Let's take a look. So as you saw, here is a list view. So that's the directions list view. And there are two critical components here. One is the model. The model is the data that powers the list view. So where is that declared? If you go to the header file, there is a property of type Q abstract list model, which has the directions, which is called the directions. This is once everything is set up, you know, and the route task is executed, it gets back the route, this property will get populated. And because it's bound to the list view, the model, um, and the, via this model property, it will get populated. Now, how do you display it? How do you render the, it will have the data. Now you'll have to figure out a way to render it just the way you want it. And that's where the delegate comes in. So in this case, we're using the direction, we are using a delegate, we named it direction delegate. So if I take a look at it, the delegate is basically just um, how it's decorated. So here is um, a rectangle that defines the, de the delegate. And within the rectangle, you have another small rectangle that's for each of these lines. So if I bring that application up, each of these lines is defined by a rectangle. And then here is the text. So this is each line of text is defined by, via this text. So how do we get this text? Well, it's just via these roles that Lucas was just talking about. So in, in route, in, in this specific case, we have a role called direction test in direction text in, the, um, in, the, in this list model. I'm going to show you in the, um, in the help as um, what are the different roles because without looking at the help, you have no way of discovering them. So this direction text has the text which um, is rendered at, in each of these, those lines. So once, let's go and take a quick look let me open Chrome, and if I look at the direction maneuver list model, you can see that these are the different roles that are defined in this list model, and here is the direction text. Because we use just the direction text, it shows me the direction text. I could have, the sample is designed in that way. It could have chosen to display the duration or the maneuver type um, or the estimated arrival time. So all these things are available 
it's a matter of how you want to render them and where you want to render them so it's as a user you have the power to use these roles to decorate them just the way you want it so that's a quick look um, at how list models work in our api there are a lot of other cases you might want where you might want to list um, to display a list model and we have lots of samples that show you list model usages throughout the samples app or individual samples so you can take a look at the source code choose to use them as examples use those code um, um, in, in any any way you want it so I hope you found this useful and you can uh, these, these components would um, help you in building um, apps for um, using the Qt SDK. That concludes my demo, and I'll hand it back to Lucas for um, uh, wrapping it up. Thanks very much. Back to you, Lucas. OK, so now we're going to wrap up, and we're going to do so by first talking about how Esri is using Qt. Well, first off, we're using Qt through the SDK that we're talking about today, the runtime SDK for Qt. Um, but another product that we have that's using Qt is App Studio for ArcGIS. You might have seen this on the plenary stage earlier this week, um, but this is a really cool application that's built on top of our SDK and on top of Qt itself to make a really nice, easy way to build applications using QML. This really gives you the right ones deploy anywhere and the nice thing about it is that you don't have to worry about all the different compilers and dependencies it's all managed through a player app that simply runs your application and they also have uh, cloud build tools so it makes it very easy to build applications so we actually then use app studio to build some other applications survey123 which is a data collection tool it's a form-based collection tool and quick capture which is a, a quick way to capture data on a map these are two applications that we build with App Studio. We also internally use uh, Qt just to test our runtime core. Runtime core, if you've ever watched the uh, runtime architecture session, I'd highly encourage that. But that's all written in C++. And because of that, we use Qt just to test the core. So how to get started? Well, the first thing I'd recommend you do is create a developer account and go to developers.arcgis.com to do that. So I'm going to jump over to the browser and show you this website. Here we are, developers.arcgis.com. You can see here that you can sign up for free. This is how you create a developer account, and this will give you access to all of our SDKs. You can download them for free and begin developing apps for free. We'll even give you some credits uh, just to get started. We also have the labs here. If you click start building your app, this will take us to the tutorials. You can filter by Qt. And you'll see all of the different tutorials here which are supported with Qt. If you click on documentation on the top, you can then browse under native SDKs. We have the runtime SDK for Qt. And this will give you access to the guide, the API reference, and our samples. Our samples are displayed in the browser here, right in the web page. But we also have these in GitHub. Finally, I wanted to show our open source apps. We build open source apps to show real world use cases of how you can use our technology. And the Dynamic Situational Awareness app is an application that's built with Qt as well. So you can download this. Um, we have some pre-built apps you can download and use. Or you can go to the repo and look at the code directly. These show patterns that we recommend following when deploying and building applications with our SDK. So just in review, we'd recommend you create a developer account first, um, then download the Qt framework and ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Qt. We have install and setup guides directly in our documentation that I was just showing. It's important to read the guide's fundamental topics. We cover some things like 
what we talked about today, like async, asynchronous tasks, uh, loadable, and so on. Um, study and modify the samples. And last but not least, use the forum and join the community discussion. This is on GeoNet, and we're a very active community. We have the development team actually watching a automatic Slack bot that will update when we get new posts. So we're very um, interested in hearing what you're working on and helping you be successful. So with that, on behalf of Koshik and myself, I would like to thank you all for watching this recording of the Building Apps with ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Qt session. We hope you found it useful. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us on GeoNet. Thank you.